um, ad mixtures out of Cleveland, Ohio. Fred is this, boy, is this a long title? The Cement Systems. Construction Systems. Uh, uh, Fred is a cement based repair material senior development scientist. That's a mouthful. And uh, with, uh, he's been with product development of cementitious materials since 1988. Uh, Fred is chair of 364, which is rehabilitation of concrete structures and is an extremely active member of 546, uh, one of the people leading the effort for the new uh, materials guide. Fred? Thank you very much. Um, okay, uh, thanks very much for the opportunity to present here, and um, thanks for making the time in your busy schedules. Um, start off with just a little bit of humor. Um, people say they fear public speaking more than you feel death, so you can save me a lot of pain if you want to kill me now rather than later. Uh, philosophy of selection of cementitious repair materials is the more similar the repair material is to the substrate concrete, the better off we are. Uh, don't repair apples with oranges. Um, therefore, the best repair material for concrete is cementitious. Not always. Because not all cementitious repair materials are the same. I'm going to discuss quite a few different materials that are covered in the 546 R04 select, uh, material guide, repair guide, including Pre-placed aggregate, fiber reinforced, ferro cement, um, roller compacted, dry pack, uh, good old basic concrete and mortar, um, cement based grouse, proprietary repair mortar, shotcrete, silica fume concrete, rapid setting materials, mag foss, and touch very briefly on polymer base because they are included in the section on uh, cementitious repair materials and briefly addressed. So if I have a repair to make, what about good old conventional concrete? The pros, it's readily available. We understand the technology pretty well. Uh, it's economical. It does have similar properties. What it can have similar properties to the substrate concrete. It's easy to produce, place, finish, and cure. It's not so good because if you don't understand the reason for the failure and the need for the repair, you're going to wind up repeating history again and again. So if concrete failed due to a material problem and you replace it with concrete, you're likely to wind up having a failure again. For a material supplier, that's not bad, but for you guys it is. Um, it can shrink. And bear in mind, uh, the repair material is going to shrink more than the substrate concrete. Substrate concrete has already had most of its shrinkage occur. Concrete's good for thick sections but you can't use it for thin or close placements, small placements, large volumes. If you're talking less than a cubic yard, ready-mix concrete's not at all practical. How do I get it to where I need to repair? If I'm on the 20th floor of a high rise doing a facade repair, that's an interesting proposition to get ready-mix up there. Uh, mix optimization. We can change the properties of concrete dramatically. What kind of concrete do you need? And the other thing, if you order too much, you either use it or lose it. So use, ordering the right quantity can be interesting. Conventional mortar has a lot of the same pros as conventional concrete. Uh, job site mix as well as prepackaged can be anything from basic sand and cement all the way to pre-formulated, rapid hardening, exotic chemistry, polymer modified, shrinkage compensated, fiber reinforced, etc. Um, can have similar properties to the basic concrete. It's not for aggressive environments. It tends to have higher shrinkage than conventional concrete. Higher water cement ratio, higher cement contents can be a problem. Uh, to achieve free slab durability in conventional mortars, it takes a higher quantity of air than concrete because the air contents based upon the pace volume, not upon the volume of the material. It can have quite a bit of variability. And what is my mix optimization? Fiber reinforced. On the pro side, 
It does have some improved cracking resistance, especially with plastic shrinkage. However, with some of the higher performance fibers now becoming available, we can achieve stress distribution. This doesn't really change the total amount of cracking as much as it just produces many more and finer cracks. Sometimes they're so fine you can't see them. Cons. Um, fibers reduce the slump. The flow decreases, makes it more difficult to place. It can be furry. If you're putting a coating on, you can wind up with a really ugly looking surface unless you address the fiber sticking up from the surface. Steel fibers uh, can produce surface rusting. Uh, fibers can ball up in the mixture, especially with the finer aggregate mixes if they're not predispersed, if you're doing a job site mix. Uh, they can increase the cost, however, bang for the buck. Fibers are usually a pretty good idea, in my humble opinion. Again, mix optimization, and what kind of fibers do I use? There's many, many different flavors and types and sizes and deniers of fibers. How do you choose the right one? Ferro cement. It's not that common a material, but it's got some very good properties. Uh, ferro cement is a high steel content concrete or mortar, has high tensile strength, and claims to have superior cracking resistance. However, that's highly dependent upon the binder. Cons. High cost. The high steel content can make placement very interesting, especially if it's conventional reinforcement, if it's done with fibers. Uh, fiber balling and finishing and fiber protrusion can make things difficult. Aren't really any known standards for the material. Uh, if one uses stainless, the cost goes through the roof, however you eliminate the rusting problems, and it's significantly heavier per unit volume than conventional concrete. Shotcrete, another material I like, doesn't require forming, it's great for vertical overhead application, uh, it likes curved surfaces, it's hard to do a flat surface, it requires additional manuality and finishing and placement techniques, it can be placed very rapidly and can be relatively impermeable. However, it uses large volumes of compressed air. It's highly dependent upon the nozzle and skill, or there are robotic devices that can now apply shock creek quite successfully, but they're very expensive as well. Uh, dust and rebound can be issues. Uh, how much shock creek do I need to do a given volume? Depends on the rebound, which depends upon the nozzle, depends upon the equipment, depends upon the placement. It's hard to estimate material quantities requires a specialized equipment. It can be really noisy. Um, the impermeability is on both plus and minus, pros and cons. It's good that it's impermeable if you want to keep chlorides and carbonation from happening. It's bad if you're repairing a water tank in a freezing environment and you put the shotcrete on the outside. Classic example, the water gets to the shotcrete, stops because it's less permeable, it freezes, it blows the shotcrete off, you're repairing the repair. Um, finishing, it's a stippled or dimpled surface, it's not flat and smooth. Uh, often accelerators are used which can make finishing quite difficult. And it's interesting to do horizontal placement of the material. You try gunning below your feet, it's not pretty. Uh, shotcrete, is also known as pneumatically applied concrete. There's two or three flavors depending on how you want to classify it. Wet mix, where the ingredients are mixed, and then high pressure air is used to spray it. Dry mix, the dry powder is conveyed and then water is added to the spray nozzle. The other flavor is a variety of wet mix where low pressure and formulated materials tend to be used to achieve the consolidation. Pre-placed aggregate concrete. Another very good material, not well utilized in the industry. <coughs> Has inherently low shrinkage, low voids, underwater placement is very amenable to it, large deep repairs and good for fast turnaround. On the cons, you don't have to have stronger form work than you do for conventional concrete, except you're dumping it full of rocks to begin with, gap graded aggregate. And that Falling of the aggregate can put a lot of stress on formwork. The other consideration, once the aggregate's in the form, you're filling the voids with a very fluid cementitious material. If the forms aren't watertight, it'll leak out. And you no longer have a uniform material. Problems. It's messy. Finding correctly graded aggregate. 
pre-placed aggregate requires a gap grading. You want avoid content between the aggregate particles. Um, you have to use a pump, so additional equipment's required, and the grout and mortar has to be formulated for the prop for the application. You can do it with cement and water, but you have bleeding, you have segregation. Better use formulated product. How does it work? You start out with a void. You fill it full of aggregate. You attach watertight forms. Pump a fluid grout from the bottom to the top. This displaces any water. This displaces the air as it fills it up. Low slump dense concrete. Special form of conventional concrete. Conventional equipment, well, you have to put a lot of energy into placing it. It has some good chloride resistance, can be very abrasion resistant. I think uh, roller compacted concrete is also a type of this. Put effort into consolidating it. Can require a lot of curing. Uh, it can have high drying shrinkage, which then negates the chloride resistance, a lot of the abrasion resistance because of cracking. It's only usable for horizontal and because it's a relatively dry, harsh mix, it can be interesting to finish. Shrinkage compensated concrete. There's an ASTM specification, ACI 223 also talks a lot about it. This is a formulated cement that expands more than it shrinks. However, and that can produce reduced cracking and you can reduce the joint spacing. Do wonderful things with this material. However, you have to design it so that the restraint is provided by the reinforcement. That means it has to bond to the steel. You have to isolate slabs from walls and walls from slabs, or otherwise the stresses can cause cracking in the adjacent members. Requires the curing. That is, if it dehydrates, it doesn't shrinkage compensate correctly, causes more problems than you had when, if you didn't use it. Sleets are a lot of design considerations. Also, the expansion rate is highly dependent upon temperature, so different modifications are required for different temperatures of placement. Silica fume concrete. These are some pictures of silica fume. It's a byproduct from the manufacturer of ferrosilicon. It's a high surface area amorphous silica that's about 100 times finer than cement produces very low permeability, very high strength, it requires a high range water reducing additive or otherwise it's sticky and too stiff to place. It's still sticky to finish, uh, has higher plastic shrinkage than conventional concrete. Silica fume optimum is around 10% of cement content, so that increases the cost quite a bit. It does not bleed. This can be good, this can be bad. Try placing a dry shake on silica fume concrete, not a good idea. It requires a wet cure, and the color uh, tends to be quite a bit darker for most silica fumes. There are some white silica fumes also in this category, or calcine medicaid ones, which produce a lighter color and uh, similar properties. Different way of getting the same point. Dry pack. Dry pack's been around for hundreds, if not thousands, of years. It's a mixture of cement and sand that is so dry, you pick up this moist looking powder squeeze it, it forms a ball. It's about the only standard that exists for it. Um, you have to put a lot of effort into consolidating it. It's economical. It's very low shrinkage. It's the lowest water cement ratio you can achieve. It's very labor intensive. How do you get the right mixture? It's an art. It's not a science. Uh, if you get too much water in it or you try to achieve the low water cement ratio with a high range water reducing admixture, super plasticizer, it can belly out and sag. The impact necessary to consolidate it can disturb the forms. It can also disturb the reinforcement. It can make consolidation quite difficult in congested areas. Uh, you can't do full depth and you can't do very shallow depth with it. Uh, curing is very critical and the substrate has to be pre-saturated. In a configuration like this, you can see a hammer driving the two by four to wedge it in place, could bow the forms out. And how do I get this saturated? It's on the underside. Proprietary mortars, um, convenient, huge range of products. Uh, they can have faster setting times, they can have shorter curing times. They're not the end all answer all to everything. Uh, they're less like the substrate, 
many of them are very cement rich, leading to high shrinkage. Uh, there aren't really any bond strength standards. They're slowly developing on the, in the market. Tend to be quite a bit higher cost. If one uses ASTM C928 to specify them, there's uh, very high chloride limits and shrinkage limits that aren't really field friendly for achieving a durable repair. Cement-based grouts tend to be economical, they're shrinkage compensated, easy to install, they're formulated products. There is a specification, C1107, which is designed for foundation grouts or um, base plate grouting. Uh, they tend to be very cement rich, uh, thickness considerations, they're not, they have minimum and maximum uh, placement thicknesses, have to wet cure them. You can aggregate extend some of them, however, if you're trying to achieve a fluid consistency and you aggregate extend, all your aggregate's going to wind up being on the bottom, so you have a non-homogeneous material for your repair. Um, anyhow, uh, substrate has to be saturated and you must provide restraint. You can't just fill the void with it. Magnesium phosphate, very rapid strength development, does not require moist curing. If you're going to use a MagFoss product, forget a whole lot of what you know about cementitious materials. They can be placed below freezing temperatures. They are good for fast turnaround. Very high bond strength, very low shrinkage. Airport, airport uh, landing zone Joint nosings are a very good application. Bridge decks where you can't afford the uh, shutdown of the traffic lanes for more than a couple of hours. Great applications for these. They can be sulfate and alkali aggregate resistant, resistant to carbonates. However, they don't like being placed against carbonaceous aggregates. If you use a limestone aggregate for aggregate extinction, you get the fizzy effect. It'll be full of voids. It'll foam. If you place these materials on carbonated substrates, you get a very weak bond. Uh, some of them do generate ammonia. Uh, they have a fixed water. Um, the, at least the materials I'm familiar with, you start out mixing with the recommended water and you say, I've got to add more water. By the time you get the water there, you're at the right consistency. It starts out dry and slowly wets out. You can have a very high exotherm. You can cook an egg on these materials when you place them. Uh, that exotherm, if it gets much above 170, 180F, uh, different crystal and structural will form in the material, which can have reduced strengths. Looks and feels the same, but can be lower strength unexpectedly. That's why aggregate extension is recommended in many placements. A very short period of set. Period of set. How long do I have to get it in the hole? How long do I have to finish it? The difference in that time interval is the period of set. These things, by the time it's ready to place, you get it in the hole, it starts to get hot, it's done. You can't place it. You can't finish it. <coughs> chemical grouts, um, they provide chemical resistance, have a wide range of consistencies and gel tines. Very high cost. They can have very different coefficients of thermal expansion than cementitious materials. Can involve working with hazardous materials. They have different moisture properties. Some of them do not like having moisture in the substrate. Some of them don't like having moist aggregate. Uh, they can have a short working time or a long working time depending upon the composition, formulation, and the temperature. Uh, which product do you use? Rapid setting cements. They're good for cold weather, they're good for fast turnaround. They can have high shrinkage, they can have reduced durability, can have a lot of problems in hot weather. Therefore, repair material selection is an informed compromise. There is no perfect material. So after about this point, you should start feeling like this guy. What do you do? How do you pick it? Well, I could spend the whole time talking about this slide. There are guidances provided in the literature um, for how to develop a repair strategy, how to select the correct repair material, but I'm not going to talk that long about the slide. It's in the handout. Read it. Most important thing, figure out why are we fixing this, the cause and the effect. This is supposed to be a tessellation showing cause and effect. If you look at it after a few beers, it does look that way. <laughs> What material do I use? Prepackaged or ready mix? 
Pre-packaged, it has specific properties, packaging convenience, you mix what's needed. You can have engineered properties designed into it. Ready mix, cost effective, it's made to order, bulk delivery, a lot of historical performance. Don't know. The heart of the matter, the cementitious binder. Ordinary Portland cement, high aluminum cement, alkali activated pozzolan, calcium sulfur aluminate cement, polymer cement, or latex modified, magnesium phosphate, gypsum. These are all common binders. All of them have different properties. All of them have different strengths and weaknesses. None of them is a perfect material. Admixtures. As I said, the heart of the matter is the binder. These are a few of the types of admixtures. Notice the arrows all go both directions and all lead towards the binder. These are all synergistic. They can either enhance each other's effects or negate each other's effects. <coughs> it shows a picture of a bunch of witches around the cauldron because that's really what it is. It's an art, not a science. I've got scientist in my title, but it is an art, trust me. Um, material supplier should never say trust me. Oh well. Uh, <laughs> why does concrete fail? The three big D's, design and construction, deterioration, and damage. Understand the relationships of these. Understand why am I fixing this? What do we mean by design and construction? First, load effects can be seismic. They can be live loads. They can be dead loads. <coughs> impact loads, wind loads. I had fun with the graphics on this. I had to show you the slide. Fire damage. No. Design and construction. This is a little bit of older data, but I don't think the statistics have changed that much. Building research establishment in England looked at 27 building projects, identified 500 quality related events. Of these quality events, 50% were design related, 28% were workmanship related, 16% were site management related. I've talked to several people in the specifying community. Roughly half of repairs fail. And the reason for repairing the repair is due to a lot of this. 94% of the quality problems were related to these three factors. We have a major education problem to do, to solve. American Society of Civil Engineers publishes a scorecard. I excerpted these from their website. This is in 2003. We got an overall grade of a D plus. And go to this website, look at it. It's got a lot of good information about how bad the situation is requiring repairs. It says still we need $1.6 trillion for, to fill a five-year need to restore our infrastructure. So going back to my main subject, the, the selection of repair materials is an informed cost compromise, not only between the material properties and the cost, the service life and the application. Looking at material physical properties, if I optimize for cracking resistance, Creep, tensile strength, modulus, bond strength, length change, thermal expansion, and flexural strength are the most important physical properties. If I optimize for durability, however, a different set of physical properties becomes important. And for serviceability, a different set of properties. What's important? The physical properties required for material selection for new construction are entirely different than those required for consideration, for repair. New construction, we specify compressive, flexural, tensile strength, freeze, thaw, durability, shrinkage. Repair materials, bond strength, shrinkage, creep, modulus, permeability, it's a different order. Is compressive strength even important in a repair? Maybe, maybe not. The current wisdom says for repair material properties, the strength of the repair should be equal to or slightly greater than the strength of the substrate. You don't need 12,000 PSI in a repair material to repair 4,000 PSI concrete. 
And the strength is not just compressive strength, it's the least important of these, the tensile strength. If I do a repair with a material with extremely high tensile strength, I can, reduce, I can resist a lot of shrinkage forces. If I have very good bond, very good adhesive strength, I again solve some of my shrinkage problems. Modulus coefficient of thermal expansion. If as the mother nature changes the temperature on me, my repair material grows or shrinks more than the substrate, I induce stress, I've limited the durability of it. Electrical and chemical properties. Uh, we've talked about corrosion cells in several of the um, presentations. This is an electrical phenomenon. If the repair material is grossly different in its electrical properties than the substrate concrete, we can have problems because of this, again, chemical. Curling shrinkage. Um, we'd like the shrinkage to be less than that of the substrate. I don't entirely know how to do that because when I change the environment, often my shrinkage compensation goes against me and I expand more than the substrate and I blow the repair apart. The creep of the repair should be about the same as the creep of the substrate. Ideally, I would like a lot of tensile creep and not much compressive creep. The literature and research is ongoing, the conclusions aren't all in, but tensile creep and compressive creep are not directly related, as near as I can tell. And we would like the repair to last as long as the original structure. So. Are there any questions? There, a on this. there were 30 handouts back there. We've got more than 30 people in the audience. So if you want a copy of the presentation, if you give me your business card afterwards, I'll be glad to email you a PDF of it. Any other questions? Either, th this is scary when you don't have questions. <laughs> yes? Self-leveling underlayment. Yes, sir. Is that considered a repair material? Uh, and is it covered by, by this, uh, this new uh, ACI uh, document? Uh, it's not specifically covered by the document. It's a special category of prepackaged um, materials. Um, it can be a repair. It can be used in new construction. Um, they tend most of them, many of them, not all of them, but many of them uh, like to be in a relatively dry environment. They're heavily shrinkage compensated. In a wet environment, often they can prematurely deteriorate. Also, placing them on a wet, a high moisture substrate can cause some issues. And what do you put over it? If you're putting an impermeable material on top of the self-leveler, you can cause a lot of problems there. So again, it's an art, it's not a science. Uh, there are no specifications in North America that I'm aware of for these materials. I believe there are specifications in Europe. Um, I'll be glad to talk to you at length about it ahead of time, but no, it's not specifically addressed in the literature, the literature we're discussing today. Yes, sir. Uh, any uh, comments on freeze-thawed durability of the magnesium phosphate products? Uh, the question is, any comments on freeze-thaw durability of the MagFoss products? I'm not aware of issues of freeze-thaw durability if the uh, water to powder ratio is maintained. Uh, scaling can occur if the material is over-finished. They do tend to be sulfate resistant and resistant to de-icing salts. So in my experience with the materials, I don't think there's a lot of free thaw durability problems. I think they, the matrix winds up being so dense that not a whole lot of water can get in there to cause those problems. Yes, sir. There are some interesting test methodologies in the German program, such as casting a ring of water around a stiff pipe, thereby testing the shrinkage versus the tensile and heat characteristics. I, are that where you place it above a beam and get the differential 
shrinkage uplift. Are any of these methods used by American manufacturers? ASTM C1581-04 is the ring method that was adopted within the past year. I'm the chair of the committee, so I couldn't have paid you to answer, ask that question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, another um, document, if I can get on my high horse a little bit, uh, the ICRI, International Concrete Repair Institute, has just published a document uh, 03740 Repair Material Data Sheet Protocol. It was a consensus document that lists appropriate test methods for characterizing cementitious repair materials. It also uses the ring test. The beam tests, um, we looked at the um, several beam tests and we decided to stay with the ring test. Um, the beam tests seem to be a bit harder to configure and less quantifiable. Uh, the ring test in ASTM is based upon AASHTO PP34, but it's designed to produce a more rapid uh, failure pattern. It's again instrumented with strain gauges. I like the method, obviously. Yes, sir? Can you have, uh, can you use uh, just a conventional concrete top and mix? The question is, can a conventional uh, topping mix, ready mix, be used on top of a slab on grade successfully? Certainly it can. If proper surface preparation is used, if the mix design is correct, if there are not other problems with the substrate, you have to make the choice between a bonded and a non-bonded overlay. Which scenario do you use? If you go with bonded, you'll have cracking if the shrinkage of the overlay is too high. If you go with non-bonded, you can have curling, which then leads to cracking. You're putting a dissimilar material on top of an existing substrate. How do you design it? How do you proportion it? We're back to the art. We're not to the science. They have been used. They do work very well. Um, although I represent a material manufacturer, I believe start with the simple, easy, and cheap solutions, work your way towards the difficult, complicated, and expensive. But know what you're doing. And you do tend to incur risk as you tend to cheapen things. Okay. Invest in surface prep, invest in design, invest in field studies and mock-ups. It works great. Is there any information on that, on, on using that material? In our guide, uh, we briefly address it. I believe other ACI documents go into it in a lot more detail. Uh, again, I can try to find the answer to your question if you want to give me your card afterwards um, because I don't know it off the top of my head. Okay. Thank you very much.